Okay. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the showroom here at Roth Living. Um, I'm Chef Ben. I will be orchestrating this convection steam oven event for the six people that we have joining us here in the showroom. And then we have quite a number online joining us as well. So welcome to all of you. And hopefully you're in a comfy spot at your home and uh, ready to, uh, to learn a little bit about what makes the Wolf Convection Steam Oven such a unique appliance. And as I was chatting with uh, some of the, the guests we have here in the showroom, I was telling them that everything that we are going to prepare today comes out of the convection steam oven to give you an idea of just the breadth of what you can do in this appliance, right? Um, I don't think that I'm really um, getting too much into the realm of hyperbole when I say that this appliance can change the way you will behave in the kitchen more than any other appliance you may ever own. In other words, if you can have an appliance that essentially doesn't need to be preheated, can add moisture, but then can brown at the same time, right? It's one of those things you're going to become your go-to appliance all the time. You know, we were, ta we were talking a little bit about it does it have any limitations? What is it that it can't do? Um, there's really not much. In fact, I can count the things it can't do on one hand when it's compared to either a regular wall oven or a microwave oven. So it really does replace two appliances. And if you include the steaming aspect, it replaces not only an in-counter steamer, but even that funny little flying saucer thing you used to put in a pot, throw your broccoli on, put a lid on and steam your broccoli. It can replace that as well. So it can replace a lot of things. And I think you'd really find it very beneficial when you bring it into your home and start cooking with it. So um, we're going to cover just about everything that makes this appliance so unique and so special. Um, we'll cook some food here in the showroom. We're sorry we can't share it with all of you at home, but you can imagine what everything tastes like. And maybe you get these guys' email address. They can give you a, a, a play by play of what everything tasted like. Um, when they got to sample it here today as well. So, um, and those, for those of you online, you may notice here in a minute or two, there will be a poll question that pops up on your screen. Um, Lynn has created that. Lynn Thielen, who is our um, showroom manager, has created that. Just to get a little feedback from those of you online, we need to kind of begin to tailor these events a little more because it feels like we're going to be doing them a lot. Uh, uh, so, if you get a chance, please answer that poll question. It will really help us out immensely here on our end as we move forward um, with our events into the rest of this calendar year. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the convection steam oven, where it came from, why it is so unique. Um, then we'll talk about the features that it has. We'll do some cooking throughout. Um, for those of you here in the showroom, should you need anything else to drink, some more water, something like that, uh, Brenda and Nicole are the two young ladies who will be assisting. So if there's anything that you need, please just flag them down and they can help you with that and we'll get you um, taken care of. So, um, so let's just kind of start off in the beginning with what is it, right? Why did this come from? What, why convection steam? How many people had heard about a convection steam oven before they ever thought about Sub-Zero Wolf in their kitchen? Have you ever heard of one before? read about it can you read about it somewhere maybe on the internet or some blog or something about cooking with no penny you'd never heard of one before no pal no so when you started exploring options for your new kitchen remodel or new build or something like that this cropped up right and where did we first hear about it showroom here right so it was here at the showroom that you first heard about it not at one of the dealers around denver or anything like that. no okay great Okay, so it is fairly new, right? For a residential appliance, this is not particularly old, right? We're talking about within the last, oh, I'd say 10 to 15 years, they have really started taking hold in American kitchens. Now in Europe, steam ovens were very, very common, obviously because they are a slightly smaller footprint in your kitchen and European kitchens tend to be a little bit smaller. So they had come up with a way to optimize um, what space they were using in their kitchens and the convection steam oven really made a difference for those smaller European kitchens, right? Now this was a technology that's been around for probably 50 or 60 years, right? This whole idea of a combination oven where you're using steam in combination with 
dry air has been around for a long time, but it was always on the commercial side of things. And not only that, it wasn't just restaurants that had it, but it was really a very particular type of restaurants, large restaurants, large hotels, convention centers. You know, I've worked for a long time in San Francisco. And when I was a culinary school student in San Francisco back in the 80s, they recruited us because the Democratic National Convention was held at the Moscone Center the summer that I was in culinary school. And they recruited all of us flunkies from the culinary school to come down and help serve these enormous banquets. And I mean, we're talking about 5,000 people seated at one time and it was table service, right? So you had to plate every single course, right? Well, when you're gonna serve prime rib to 5,000 people, you have to cook a lot of prime ribs and you had to cook a lot of them at once and you wanted them all to be the exact same internal temperature and you wanted them to be able to hold at a really good serving temperature for a long period of time because you couldn't precisely time exactly when you were gonna carve the prime rib and then you know, serve it. You had to basically know that they were done, they were held, they would not overcook and they would not dry out. So the convection steam oven was employed right, in these huge um, kitchens where they would have walls of these things. And you would roll into those 25 prime ribs into each oven. And we probably had, I don't know, a dozen of those ovens. So we've got all these prime ribs all cooking simultaneously. They're all calibrated to cook at the same time, all cook nice and moist, all hold then when they're done being prepared and they've reached the internal temperature that we wanted, then the oven would hold it at that temperature so that we could then serve it when we were ready to slice it. That same technology that went into those giant ovens, right, that did those preparations, is the same thing that you find in the Wolf Convection Steam Oven. It's that same technology that combines steam and dry air together to create a really unique roasting or baking environment, and then it can hold product moist and juicy, at the exact same temperature that you want it to be prepared to for a fairly long time. So you could almost indefinitely, it'll just hold it for you so you can serve it when you're ready to serve it. So that technology is fairly old. It's been around. They've obviously made it a lot smaller. As you can see, um, my convection steam oven, which is there on the far, um, well, that would be your right, but in that far corner, right, is um, that's trimmed to be a 30 inch oven, but is actually a 24 inch opening, right? The size of the, in of the cavity itself is only 24 inches. So you can see it's a fairly small cavity, about the same size as a microwave. In fact, it takes the same opening as a microwave, um, but trimmed to look just exactly the same width as your 30 inch wall oven, or you can mount it over some other sort of appliance. In fact, our, uh, our showroom manager in Salt Lake City, she just built a new kitchen in her home and uh, sh her convection steam oven is literally on a wall by itself. I mean, there's this entire wall, all these beautiful wood cabinets, and then right in the middle is one appliance, and that's it, right? So you can mount it pretty much wherever you want, right? You can just put it, stick it whatever works best for you. We generally recommend that when you do install it, install it a little higher, right? Don't put it underneath the counter, because it obviously produces steam when you open the door, that steam can come up in your face, you don't really want that. It's also easier to clean and to operate when it's at about eye level. So I like a mounting height. That might be a little tall, but you know, I wouldn't go much higher than that, but a little shorter than that works really nicely. So there's the convection steam oven. It's a small opening. It's really, again, one of its few limitations, if you will, that it's not an enormous oven cavity. And the reason it's not an enormous oven cavity is pretty much because we have to generate steam in there. We have to fill that oven cavity with steam and we'd need a really big boiler if the cavity was larger and larger and larger. We might get uneven cooking. It might not be as efficient and not give you the, the quality of the product that you're looking for if we don't, if we made it any larger. So it pertains that it, it comes in that size only, but it really does make a huge difference in terms of the quality of the cooking that you get out of it in there. So um, we'll talk a little bit today too, as we go through about just kind of what you can do with it and how you can essentially drive the appliance, right? So there's more than one way that you can 
uh, use the appliance. You can do like what I call manual transmission where you make all the decisions. I want steam. I want my steam to be 200 degrees and I want it to steam whatever I'm cooking for 15 minutes. Completely on you. It's all about what you decide to do with the oven, right? Then there's the more automatic transmission where you say, ah, I want to cook an artichoke. I have no idea how long I should cook an artichoke. I have no clue. You find the artichoke button in there. You put the artichoke on the tray, put it in the oven. You hit the artichoke button and the oven cooks it for you knowing that it's an artichoke. But that same thing could be true of a prime rib or a loaf of bread or something like that. It has these programs built in. It's our Wolf Gourmet features, right? And they're extensive. In fact, no other appliance that we make has as an extensive a gourmet feature as the convection steam oven. I think there's about at least 125 processes built into the oven that is completely in the oven. So you just choose what you want to cook and the oven will do it for you. And there, are in some cases, different ways to the same end. In other words, different ways to cook a chicken breast, different ways to roast a pork loin, different ways to bake some potatoes or roast potatoes. There's different ways to do all of it. So try to make sure that I give you as much of that information as I possibly can here today. So to start off, I wanna just kind of do the most basic cooking technique that you can do in the convection steam oven. And that's just steam, right? Now, what are the advantages of steam? What's, where's gonna be the great advantage of cooking with steam? Moisture. Moisture, what else? Flavor retention, nutri nutrients, right? We've all heard that, right? That it's always better to cook, to steam your vegetables versus boiling your vegetables because then you don't lose any of the nutrients in the water, right, that you were cooking them in, right? They were all retained in the vegetables. So steaming is a less, it's less depleting of the, the nutrients in the vegetables, right? What else do you think steam could be, is really beneficial for? What else do you think about steam that's, maybe is not quite so apparent, right? When you think about it. it, does retain heat well. In fact, more than retaining heat well, steam transfers heat better than anything else. And a good example of that is, right? If I have my M series wall oven on here and it's 400 degrees and I have a tray of biscuits in there, as long as I put something on my hand, I can put my hand in the oven, right? and remove that tray, right, no problem. 400 degrees, I can stick my hand in that oven all day. Am I putting my hand here ever? How hot is the steam? So that's significantly cooler than the temperature in the oven, right? But the steam will scald and burn me almost instantaneously if I put my hand in there. So what's that teaching us? It's teaching us that Water vapor transfers heat from the oven to the food far more quickly and far more efficiently than dry air does, which is why if we can use steam to assist our cooking in the convection steam oven, then we can accelerate cooking times or shorten cooking times, right? We can moisturize things. We've already said it's obviously moisture present, right? So now we're cooking faster, we're using moisture, right, to make, you know, to keep our food a little more moist, not let it dry out. So all of these things are going to be beneficial. And it starts cooking immediately, which is why that only about 15% of the time that you're using that oven to cook something in, you have to preheat it. The rest of the time, the food goes in a cold oven, and it starts cooking immediately. And when we start talking about those combination modes, right, what the oven does in convection steam mode when we're using the combination of steam and dry air, right? We'll understand why when we're cooking with the steam, we don't need to preheat, right? It's very, very rare that whenever there's steam involved, we're preheating an oven, right? So it's just a steamer, right? It can just be a steamer. And that's a little more sophisticated than some of the other steamers you might have seen. It has a lot of ability to, um, to, 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 to give you a lower temperature, right? Than 212 or 210, right? We say 210 just because here in Colorado, we can never get to quite to 212, right? But um, 
we can always go down to 90 degrees, right? 90 degree steam. What the heck would you use 90 degree steam for? It's possible, yes. You could definitely use it for reheating. Great. It's a good, what else might you use 90 degree steam for? What can you think of? Veggies, yes, slow cooking. You can use it as a lower temperature. Because obviously every time you have a lower temperature than, you know, than, than the maximum temperature of steam, 210, or like the maximum temperature of the oven is 440. But anytime we're using a low temperature, we're slowly cooking stuff. We're, we're creating a, a, a gentler, softer environment. What's one process that no one really likes doing in their microwave unless they are absolutely forced at gunpoint to use their microwave for? What is that one process that we just, no? Well, that's true. That is true. Okay, so there's two things. Well, you, that, you can't do that in there, unfortunately. But what do you just, what do you just like, oh, I have to do this in my microwave and it's gonna be just weird. Bingo, defrost. We've all defrosted stuff in a microwave and it gets that weirdness to it, right? There's like that partially cooked and the middle is like this weird gelatinous texture because the microwave is trying to cook it from the inside, but it's, you know, it's got, and so then there's all that water in the container and it's like sitting in this goop, yuck. 90 degree steam. Take your frozen chicken breast, leave them in the package, throw them in a 90 degree steam oven. Let them defrost naturally, slowly. Will it be as fast as a microwave? No. But will it cook it at all? Never. And you don't get all that weird gloopy liquid in the package, right? It's, it's like you never froze it in the first place because it defrosts really gently. So 90 to 110 degree steam, great for defrosting, right? Takes a little longer, but it's a safe environment, right? You can put your chicken breast in there and let it defrost. Great, comes out better. Yes, Ken. Could the could the steam oven replace your microwave for quickly reheating product? Ken, thank you. So now Ken's just asking if I can use the microwave for quickly reheating product. Depends on how you define quickly, but and to Will's point about reheating pizza, which in a microwave is always a disaster. Right? I mean, there's nothing worse than that, like an opaque cheese. It's quick, but the cheese is weird and the crust is always like, you can't eat it. It's because like, I don't know what the microwave does to like cooked pizza crust, but it makes it almost like you'd need to be like, they need the canines of a gray wolf to cut through some of that stuff. So yes, it can reheat anything. And we'll talk about reheating as a concept. Um, later, but it reheats anything better than a microwave ever hopes to reheat something. Lynn, you have a question from an online customer? Yeah, Tammy's wondering how long it would take to defrost, like, say, like a pound of ground beef. It'll probably take anywhere between 18 and 30 minutes, depending on how thick the package is, right? So, does that make sense? But, so, 18 to 30 minutes to defrost a pound of ground beef just depends on how thick that pound of ground beef was. If it's a little thinner, it'll defrost faster. If it's thicker, it may take a little bit longer. So, but from steam, right? You get that steam instant, instantly in the oven, right? When you want to just, whatever you want to do. So what do we like to steam? What steam we use for, usually? Vegetables, what else? Fish, seafood, right? We like to use it for that because it's gentle doesn't dry things out, right? When we want to steam some salmon or lobster or crab, you want to warm up crab's legs, right? Can't think of a better place to warm up crab legs than in convection steam oven because that steam's just going to envelop them, get them nice and hot all the way through without pulling the moisture out, right? That's one of the nice things about steam versus a boiling pot, right? When you put something in boiling water, right, that's protein, you're just extracting moisture from that piece of meat or seafood or whatever it might be. Steam doesn't do that. Steam envelops and it cooks and heats it through, right? It's vapor, it moves through the food so it heats it through. Instead of pulling the moisture out, it's heating it from without. So when we're cooking with steam, we're cooking things gently and making them really, really you know, soft and silky on your palate. So with seafood, I always like to use a slightly lower temperature. 
everybody hears poached fish before, right? Poached salmon, maybe you poached, you, you um, cook some lobsters or something like that. Ideal way to cook fish is not at the rolling boil, right? But at slightly lower temperature. Because now, right, when we're, even when we're poaching and we're immersing something in the water or the liquid, corpouillon, something flavorful, right? When we're putting that food in there, we are infusing that flavor into the food. And as long as that liquid is not boiling, now that flavor is infusing rather than just pulling moisture out. Super hot liquid is just gonna extract moisture. Liquid that's slightly cooler than that. And when I say slightly cooler, if we say the boiling point is 210, if you're at 175, 180, that's gently cooking. It's gonna make it even softer and more flavorful. So for seafood, that's an ideal way to cook. And that's how we can cook here in the convection steam oven. So what's the one ingredient we need for steam? Water, right? So what you'll learn about our convection steam oven is that it is not plumbed. You do not need a water line. You do not need a drain line. Those are not requirements to install a convection steam oven. You can literally just make a hole, make sure there's a plug, stick it in there, and off you go. You don't have to have the plumber over and he'll charge you $500 an hour to run a water. You know, if you're, don't need that. You just need to put water in it, right? So where does the water go? So I've seen some of our competitors' ovens. When you need to refill the reservoir, what do you have to do? You have to open the door. So what happens if you run out of water in the middle of the steaming process? You're losing the heat and the steam because you got to refill the reservoir, right? That's no good. So we decided we weren't going to do that. We're not putting our reservoir inside the oven. Our reservoir is up here. And it's in this drawer. It just pops out of the front of the, door, of the oven. So whenever I need to make steam, if I'm going to be cooking with steam, whether it's pure steam or convection steam, doesn't matter. I'm reheating. I need some steam. We're going to make sure we fill this. We're going to fill this from the tap, right? We're not going to refill it with some special demineralized, deionized, special water or anything like that. You can put Evian in here. It's not going to make a difference, right, to the way. It's just going to be steam. But you definitely want to make sure you're refilling it from the tap. You don't need to um, – you don't want to use water that's been uh, – completely stripped of all its mineral content. So if any of you are considering the convection steam oven and you have a, a, a reverse osmosis filtration system for your whole home, not just that little thing on the counter where you get a glass of water, but for the whole house, you're gonna need to put some extra water in here. You're gonna fill it from your tap, but you're gonna add a tablespoon of bottled water, whatever it is, because you need the minerals in there so that if it does run out of water, the oven knows that the reservoir is empty, and then it stops trying to make steam with an empty reservoir, right? So you need a little minerals in the water so that the sensors in the oven work really, really well. Yes, Ken? It won't matter. You just, no. We'll talk about descaling it, but you. Is there like an indicator on the reservoir that tells The oven will talk to you, and it will literally tell you please refill my reservoir. And the, the beautiful thing is, is that, what's that? No, unfortunately, it's very, very soft-spoken, this oven. It really is. I mean, I have to admit, you know, a lot of people, all of our other appliances, or in fact, all of our appliances, you can control the volume, things like that. You can turn this up as loud as it goes, and you better be in the same room, because you're not going to hear it if you're two rooms away. Right? It's not like some of our other appliances would make it like an obnoxious kind of buzzing noise or beeping, and they're incessant. This is so gentle. It's like, you'll hear it, but it's like, diddling, diddling. you think, oh, that's very pleasant, but it, it wouldn't wake you up, let me tell you. So, um, but once this is full, as I said before, if I'm running my steam at full power, 210 degrees, it's going to last between 90 minutes and two hours of just pure steam before I need to refill that reservoir. In most cases, two hours of steam is a very long time, right? You're not likely to be steaming anything for longer than two hours. But if you are, and the oven runs out of water, it will push the drawer out. It'll write, it'll display a message that says, please refill the reservoir. It'll make its little chiming noise, right? And if you're running a program where it's timed, it will pause the timer 
at the moment that it ran out of water. And so long as you don't open the door, you don't lose any heat, you don't lose any steam. So it will retain, it'll maintain the temperature of the oven until you put the water back into the reservoir and restart it. But, and it restarts on its own. You don't have to hit start, it just goes. It'll just pick right back up once you slide that drawer back in. So it'll take care of you in that way when you're making steam, all right? So with your oven, you get special trays because your regular baking sheets won't just slide into this oven. You need trays that fit into the racks on either side of the oven. Now, if you want to use your own pan, whether it's a nine by 13 baking pan or it's a small baking sheet, there are racks, you get two racks like this. So when you have your own pans and you're going to bake some brownies or, you know, roast a chicken or whatever it might be, you can just put it right on here if you want, right? And just lay these in the oven. These oven, these racks are also great for hard boiling your eggs. If you ever decide that you need to hard boil 32 eggs simultaneously, just lay them right here on this, hit the eggs button, go for hard cooked, and in half an hour, you will have 32 perfectly hard boiled eggs with a creamy center on their yolk and no green, no gray, ever. So great way to hard boil eggs. No pots, no guessing, right? Because does everybody have their own way of cooking a hard boiled egg? I mean, I think every chef I know has a slightly different method for hard boiling eggs. Some chefs say it goes into boiling water. Some chefs said, no, it should go into cold water and you bring it up to a temperature and then you got to cover it and you got to let it sit. I've read about a thousand different ways to hard boil an egg. This way, foolproof. And if you can do 32 at once, I mean, it makes Easter a snap, right? Right there. So, or if you love egg salad, right? That's good too. So, so anyway, you get three trays. You get the rack, you get a solid tray. Obviously great for roasting. You can bake on this. You can roast your vegetables, whatever you like, right? You get one of these. And you get a perforated tray, which is obviously ideal for steaming. But you put a piece of parchment on here and it's this, right? So you can bake on this as well. Right, so you can do all sorts of different things with these trays. And these trays fit right into the racks in your oven. And when I open the oven and we talk about it a little closer, you'll see. But I just want you guys all to know there is a front and there is a back, right? You see how this is more sloped? This goes to the back of the oven. This is the part you grab when you want to remove it. This is just to help the performance of the oven for the airflow across the food. So this is going in first. So just remember that when you're using it. So when we're making steam, obviously, some of that water is going to condense in the oven or you're going to be steaming something and there's going to be water dripping off of that product, right? And so instead of having to clean it up off the floor of your oven, which is not hard, but it could be a hassle, it's a great idea when you want to steam something that you know is going to release some moisture to put the solid tray below the steaming tray. It really helps you just clean up and all that kind of stuff. And we'll talk about cleaning up, but I will tell you right now, there is no appliance that you will buy from us ever that is easy to clean, as easy to clean as this. Well, an induction cooktop may have it on that, but this is really easy to clean, really easy to clean and maintain. All right, so like all of our Wolf ovens, our ovens are numbered one, two, three, four on the racks, bottom to top, right? So when I refer to rack position two or three, you know we're going from the bottom up, okay? So as I said, I'm gonna steam. So I wanna put this below my tray. So how do I talk to this oven? How do I interface with it? So just so you know, this is not a touch screen. I can knock on this all day long and nothing will happen except that my knuckles will eventually bruise, okay? These are how I talk. I use these buttons, these words and these icons on here. That's how I talk to the oven, right? So I wanna use steam, which is the very first icon here. And whenever I wanna choose something, I just hit the enter button. Now the oven likes to tell you exactly how it wants to be handled. So when you type in steam, the first thing it tells you is that if you're going to cook one tray of something, just use rack position two. But if I want, I can use any of the other racks in combination, one through four. So I could steam four trays simultaneously. It's the only mode that I can do something with four trays at the same time is steaming. Everything else, I'm limited by the number of trays I can use, but when I'm steaming, I can use all four at once. So as long as I have four trays, I can use all four positions should I want to, okay? But the oven's always gonna tell me that. And then it's gonna give me this little box in the middle with a check mark in it. 
And what that means is, is that if I don't say enter, yes, I understand what you're telling me, it's just going to sit here and it's not going to do anything. And it'll just wait. It's very patient. It'll just wait for you. So I'm going to put this in rack position number one. So now I'm going to just do a quick steaming of some, some shrimp. So I've got some fresh shrimp. I've just tossed it with a little bit of salt and I'm going to pour it onto my perforated tray. I want you to think about if you ever make something like a uh, shrimp cocktail or something like that, how long does it take to get the water hot so that you can cook the shrimp to make shrimp cocktail? I know saying, oh yeah, I just go to Tony's and buy those pre-cooked shrimp. I don't know, that, that's cheating. Because you can imagine how many of those shrimp they're cooking at once. That's gotta be a little terrifying when you go in and you're buying pre-cooked shrimp and those are being brought in. I mean, they must be cooking like 6,000 pounds at once or something ridiculous, right? So anyway, shrimp are on there. It's telling me rack position too. So I just hit enter and now it's gonna allow me to change the temperature, right? All of these little boxes give me a certain operation that I can do to work with the oven. So in this case, I want to change the temperature. Like as I said before, I like to cook my shrimp or my seafood a little bit lower temperature. So I'm going to go down to 200 degrees. Not that much lower, but enough that it makes a difference. Once I've got it in there, I can lock that temperature in, but it also shows you what my temperature range is for that mode, right? 90 to 210 degrees. That's a wide range. So we talked about using it 90 to 110 to defrost, right? Who here ever likes to cook sous vide? Has anybody cook sous vide cooking? Anybody done that? You know what that means? Cooking in a bag, right? Under a vacuum, right? You put something in a bag, then you cook it, then you take it on the barbecue and you just mark it really fast. Sous vide is a unique way of cooking because the food that you're cooking can never exceed the temperature of the oven. So if I put the steak in a bag with all my aromatics and I cook it in a 135 degree oven, the steak can never exceed 135 degrees ever. It's not physically possible, right, for that to happen. So now my steak is perfectly cooked all the way through because it was in the oven for an hour and 20 minutes, but it never got above 135 degrees. So the middle is 135 degrees, the outside's 135 degrees. So then all I have to do is heat up my barbecue, take the steak out of the bag, quick sear it on both sides, and I have a perfectly cooked medium rare steak. Sous vide can be done not just in a water bath, but in 135 degree steam. It'll do exactly the same thing. So you can sous vide in this oven as well. So if you wanna get into that kind of cooking, and it's kind of fun, honestly, you can, you can do that, you know, for your next dinner party, you want to give everybody a perfectly cooked steak. You just cook everybody's steak exactly to the way you like it. And then they have to decide that that's perfect. But anyway, um, so that's the other reason that you can go nice and low. So 90 to 210 degrees gives you that range. So, and you know that the food can never exceed the temperature of the oven. So that way you can cook sous vide in here just as well with using just steam. So now that I've gotten to the 200 degrees, I'm going to hit enter and that's going to lock that in. Now, the next button is a duration button, right? And this is a nice feature because on the oven, it allows you to set the exact time that you want the oven to do what you're telling it to do. And anywhere from 10 seconds to nine hours and 59 minutes. Yes, Lynn, you have a question. You absolutely do. You're not just putting it in the oven. That's just be steaming. You got to put it in a vacuum seal bag. You can put it in a Ziploc bag. You can do that with the uh, water immersion method to get all the air out of the bag. You want to get the air out, right? So. so you can set a duration. When you know exactly how long you want to cook something, you can tell the oven, cook it exactly this long. The advantage of that is that the minute that it reaches the end of that duration, it turns the oven off. So you're not going to overcook it right? It's not going to keep cooking. It'll stop exactly when you want it to. And the beautiful thing is if you're using steam and a duration, even if like you cooked it, right? You've cooked whatever you're cooking, your salmon, whatever it might be. And you're in the garden and you forgot, oh, five minutes ago, I, my duration was up. Well, the beautiful thing about steam is A, it's very forgiving. So it's not very likely that what you've cooked is going to be overcooked. And B, the oven already turned itself off and it's starting to cool itself down. So it's, it's not going to overcook your food. Yes, Ken. Can you tell, hey, I want, I want it done in 
You can, and we'll talk about that. So I'm gonna set a duration for this. The default is 15 minutes, that's way too long. We're gonna cook these shrimp for eight minutes. Now notice the oven, not preheated, it's completely cold, right? Nothing, still, you know, nice and cold. So and I got it eight minutes. Now, this, unlike a microwave, right? You don't have to press the start button. See this little thing right here, which is counting down? If I just let that count down to the end, it'll turn itself on. It'll do it on its own, right? I can start it if I want to. I just scroll to the end and hit start operation and that'll jump start it, if you will. But now it just turned itself on. So the first thing this is gonna start doing is it's gonna start making steam. And at temperatures below 250 degrees, you will see water condensing on the inside of the oven cavity. But at temperatures above 250 degrees, when steam is being employed, you'll never see condensation on the oven. But know this, there is always steam in the oven cavity. When that little steam box is checkmarked, there's always steam being pushed in. Even though you can't see it, it's a very moist environment, very, very high humidity environment. So it's cooking things very, very quickly. It's accelerating the cooking. So now we're just steaming, right? We're just using that pure steam to cook those shrimp. And in the amount of time that it would probably take to just bring a pot of water to the boil and get ready to cook some shrimp, I can have these completely done, right? Except maybe on induction. Induction, it might be, the water might boil fast enough that it would be a close race. So, steaming, right? is just the very baseline of what this oven can do, right? Because it's not just a steamer, right? It can go beyond that with the other four modes, but we use steam in a lot of other ways, right? We're gonna use steam always when we're reheating something. So both Will and Ken were talking about the reheating, right? What can it do from a reheating point of view? Well, like I said, when you're using steam, you're re-moisturizing things. So like that pizza that we were talking about before. One of the problems with putting pizza in a microwave is, is that it's taking the moisture out of the pizza. It's warming it up, but it's also extracting what, left, what moisture was left in that pizza. In this case, when we're reheating, we're using a certain amount of steam to rehydrate that crust. So then once it's been rehydrated, we can crank that temperature up to about 365 degrees and now all of a sudden the pizza is getting crispy again like it was when you first got it out of the box right that crust has got a nice chew to it but it's not inedible that's where steam really comes in to invaluable when we're talking about a reheating appliance in fact one of the last modes in the oven is reheat and it's just designed for reheating anything not just pizza but Meatloaf, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, lasagna, chicken pot pie, yesterday's enchilada casserole, egg rolls, right? Something that you might want to be crispy, right? We can use a little bit of steam to refresh it, but then we can turn the temperature up even higher to make something crispy again, right? So it has that ability, right? It has the capabilities of not only rehydrating, but then it can make things crispy again because it can get so nice and hot. So from a reheating point of view, there's nothing. And I'm gonna give you an example. I've got a cast, I've got a baked ratatouille here, right? So fresh vegetables, they were completely cooked about three or four hours ago. They've been just sitting at room temperature. We're gonna flash them in here to reheat them later when we serve them. And you'll just see how nicely they reheat in the oven. So you can use reheating for lots of different things. So. I'll turn the light on and so you can see now it's completely fogged over, right? All that water vapor and air is condensing on the cooler parts of the oven, on the door, which is the coolest part, right? Then there'll be a certain amount of water that will trickle down from the sides of the walls, right? And pool in the bottom of the oven, right? There'll be a small pool of clean water. It's just condensed steam water um, in the bottom of the oven, right? So whenever you see the water, what you need? That's it. Um, whenever you see that water, just know that that was just this extra steam that just condensed and 
collect it in the bottom of the oven. Yes, Ken. So what's the learning curve on your time? Because I know it's like you said, oh, I know I want to do shrimp for 80 minutes. Mm -hmm. right? And I noticed that it started counting down rather than Immediately. But, but obviously, immediately, for the first, I don't know how long, it's doing nothing, right? So oh, no, it is doing something. The minute the steam, the boiler produces the steam almost instantaneously. When that water gets pumped into that boiler immediately upon starting, and so already the oven is heating up, there is a heating element below. So it's also creating a little extra heat in the bottom of the oven, right? To regulate the heat in the oven, there's an element below the floor. So that if I set the temperature at 180, right? The heat of the oven is 180, but there's always steam present in a full steam environment, right? So that's how we're able to get that heat up Right, and keep it consistent, but the steam is produced almost instantaneously when we start. So it starts cooking that quickly, right? And just, and obviously when there is the steam, as we talked about before with the pot, it's cooking immediately on contact with those, with that food, right? So, and then we're down to about two minutes and 40 seconds, right? Okay. So while we're just finishing that up, I'm gonna pass these two chickens to Nikki and she's gonna go put these in a different convection steam oven. And I want to explain to you how we're gonna cook those um, in a second, but she's gonna pop those in the oven for us. Um, where did I go? I, where I was going, I <laughs> got sidetracked. Um, so, you can see with the steam, you have, that, you have that really nice control over just how you can cook. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be immediate upon contact in the oven with that steam. It's going to shorten those cooking times. So the reason that it's able to accelerate cooking times is because even if I'm cooking at a higher temperature, right, 350, right, all the time that the oven is heating up to 350, there's steam present in that oven. So it's already cooking the food before we actually get to the temperature that we want from the, for, the, for the maximum in our oven. So that helps us cook. We're not just waiting for the oven to preheat and then entering it. And then you've got to wait for the heat to be transferred to the oven. It's literally cooking immediately upon the entrance of the steam into the oven. So that's one of the reasons it's able to accelerate the cooking process, even at lower temperatures. It's going to cook a lot faster. These are steam only, yes. We're going to use the other cooking modes, convection steam, and I'll explain how we cook some of these other items and the different modes we use for those as well, because uh, there's all there's an example of each one of the cooking modes in the oven. Pardon the noise on the ice. So all I've got here is just a bowl of fresh ice. We're getting down to the very end of the process. Now, some of the excess water in the oven, right, is if it's in the boiler when it's being made into steam, if there is no, um, if we're done, right, some of that water is then reclaimed from the boiler and is pumped back into your reservoir. So you'll notice every once in a while, your reservoir, you filled it up halfway, you did a steaming process, then you thought, oh, I'll just check the reservoir, and you look and it's like still like really close to halfway, and you say, but I steamed for like 20 minutes, I don't understand why there's not less water. A lot of that water gets recaptured and gets pumped back in to your reservoir. So it's a way that we're able to, so there's the chime, you hear it? Not the loudest in America, right? So now you're gonna notice too, when I open the door, you're gonna get a big puff of steam. But don't worry, if you have really nice cabinets above it or anything like that, the steam is not going to damage your cabinetry, right? So even though you have, this is pure wood up here, it's not impacting negatively at all the finish on the cabinets above. So here are our shrimp and you can see they just come out just looking nicely steamed, right? And we're just gonna pop those onto our ice. And then I've got some fresh lemons. Just gonna squeeze the lemons right on top. And then a little bit of white wine. You guys all know the rule for cooking with wine, right? Well, yes, but really what's more important is that you'd be willing to serve it to somebody you like, right? So if you would be willing to say, oh, 
you should try this wine. It's really good. You can cook with that because you'd give it to your friend. But if it's wines that you wouldn't give to your worst enemy, you can't cook with that. Because you know what happens, right, when you cook with wine. The first thing that goes is the alcohol. And that may be the only redeeming quality a bad wine ever had, right? So the minute you get rid of it, you've really, you've really lessened the so we're just going to toss this. All right. So I'll pass this over. Just so you know, when you do this, right, when you put it on the ice and you give it the wine, you give it the lemon, don't let it sit there for more than five minutes, right? Just to get, to get it cold. But don't let it sit in the, in the water. Just don't let it get cold and it'll, it'll just be... Uh, Super nice. How did you guys like that Julia James Chardonnay? Do you like that? That is okay. Because you guys said you like buttery, oaky. You like the, which is not, I think the Julia James may be a, like a malolactic fermentation. So I'm not sure it's uh, quite as aged as that, but anyway. All right. So I just want to show you the liquid that comes off. And this is why you put the pan in the oven, right? So you can see there's what, maybe third of a cup of liquid on the pan. This just makes it easier to clean up after all. You could let this fall on the bottom of your oven. That's not really a big deal um, with this oven, right? It's really easy to, as I said before, to clean up, but this just makes it a little easier for you because these can go in the dishwasher if you've got a big enough dishwasher, right? You don't have to wash all of these by hand, right? You can put those in your dishwasher. Now, there's that water I was telling you about right there. You see that little bit of water there, and that's nice and clean. So it's always a good idea when you're using the oven, um, just have a clean towel here so you can wipe out the inside of the oven, right? That's no problem whatsoever just for keeping it clean. But again, it's like a self-cleaning appliance, right? Anytime there's steam, it's washing the walls, right? So even though you have, you might have grease from roasting those chickens, something like that, a little bit of steam in there, it's helping keep the walls just a little bit cleaner. And if you really want to talk about cleaning the oven, I'll be happy to give you my two cents on cleaning the oven, but it is really easy. For those of you who know a little bit about the history of this showroom, we've been here since December of 2018. This oven was obviously installed at the time we opened. So it's been in constant use for almost two years, almost two years, right? All I've ever done to clean it is use a little bit of Bon Ami or Barkeeper's Friend and the water and that's it, and a blue scotch bright pad, and that's all I have to do. No chemicals, no anything like that, right? And here's one of the great things, right? For those, for the ladies here who might have to clean this, right? You might have to, oh, you're, make, you're making Will clean it? Well, Will, here's, this is for Will. All right, so here's, here's a great trick, right? I'm not, I am not what they would say a tall person, right? So cleaning this oven, right? I can't even get close to the back of the oven right here, right? Well, some very intelligent person realized that if you put two clips here, you lift the oven to a 45 degree angle, the door comes off. Now, cleaning it's a snap. Really easy to clean it. The racks on the side, they can go into the dishwasher. Those can just get run through the dishwasher. It's all stainless steel on the interior, so it's very easy to clean. Very, very easy to maintain. You can maintain an oven that looks like you bought it last week, right? Well into the future, right? Unlike, you know, you don't have to run a four hour cleaning cycle when after Thanksgiving, when your oven is just caked with everything from Thanksgiving is splattered and everything like that. And you need to run the clean. This, you'll never have to do that. So. so steam, right? That's just a basic, right? That's a baseline, right? The other baseline mode is just convection, right? Just a convection oven. We all know a little bit about convection, right? What do we know about convection? Circulating air, right? It's fans, it's moving air, right? Why do we have convection? Why do we want convection? Faster, what else? Uniform, that's really the, that's really the key, right? It's uniform. It, in other words, I wanna be able to bake top and bottom without having to switch, right? I want to just, everything's the same. I don't have to like move pans around. 
don't have a hot spot so that my cookies in the back are completely blackened while the ones in front look like they never were in the oven in the beginning, right? So we have a convection system in there as well. Now I'm gonna tell you full disclosure. If I'm doing three trays of chocolate chip cookies, right? Am I gonna use this oven or this oven? Personally, I'm using my M series, my E series, my dual fuel. If I've got a wall oven like this, right? The convection systems in these ovens, very, very sophisticated, lots of functionality. I can do four or five trays simultaneously without any sort of heartburn, right? The convection in here will work great, but it's really better designed for something that I don't really think steam is gonna benefit, right? So steam might not benefit biscuits or croissants or souffles, right? I don't really need steam for any of those things. So I might just wanna use convection for that. Well, if I'm just gonna bake one tray of those things, yeah, I could use the small oven. But if I'm gonna use what convection, what it was really designed for, which is multiple plain cooking, I'm using my big ovens, right? But we have convection in the convection steam oven because A, it's part of the name, and B, we need that fan and we need that heat, that dry heat, so we can you know, give you a, another oven that you can use for all sorts of different events. So convection is, again, gonna be that mode that you're gonna use when you don't really need steam, when steam's really not gonna benefit you, right? And those times are pretty evident, you know, something that's dry, right? Certain cookies don't need steam. Certain cakes don't need steam. Right? I don't need to bake a sheet cake, right? Or a you know, a, you know, just a regular cake. I don't really need steam for that. It's not going to benefit it, you know. Yes, Ken. Getting back to your shrimp. Uh -huh. So, is it a trial and error learning curve when you said? Oh, I never answered your question. Ten minutes. I'm not one to be capable. I'm assuming everybody here online is local. What about altitude? So altitude will have no impact on it, right? Unless you, I mean, even if you're in Leadville, right? and you're, the water is gonna be maybe the steam one or two degrees cooler, not that much cooler, so it might take a tiny bit longer just because the water's boiling at a slightly lower temperature, so the steam is gonna be slightly cooler in the oven. So you're talking about 209 degree steam, 208 degree steam. That's not gonna have a huge impact on the cooking times, slightly lower. Um, when you're talking about converting, when you're just using steam, right, to convert, or to, um, to cook with, we're talking about vegetables, you're usually looking um, at the highest temperatures. Uh, pure steam is gonna, it's really gonna depend on just the, the, the type of the vegetable. Broccoli is gonna cook slower than asparagus. Asparagus is gonna cook faster than carrot. I mean, so those, the density of the vegetable is gonna make a big difference. So, the advantage is when you get the oven, you get a sheet that comes with the oven that basically gives you approximate times for all of those cooking operations. Uh huh. Right. Well, we'll talk about bread here in a minute, but I'll and I'll give you that um, skinny on that. So, so the steam is one of those, as I said before, manual transmission. I decide I want to cook with steam. I set the temperature. I set the time, right? That's a manual. I'm doing all the deciding, right? Regardless of what mode I have. And there's five of those. There's the, like I said, the convection and the steam. Then there's convection steam, which is his own mode. I'm going to talk about that extensively here in a second. Then there's convection humid, and then there's reheat. Those are your five manual transmissions. You decide, right? But then there's that gourmet feature. Right, that I kind of referred to earlier. The gourmet feature is where instead of deciding what the oven does, you just tell it what you want to cook. Right? And I said there's like 125 or so different processes in there. And the gourmet feature is accessed really easily because it's right up here. But instead of you just look at what you want to cook. So here's a good for you, Ken, if you're looking at vegetables, what are all the different vegetables that can be cooked in here, right? Well, there's leaf spinach, there's cauliflower, there's broccoli, there's peas, there's green beans, fresh green beans, carrots, mixed vegetables, corn on the cob, beets, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, summer squash, all these different vegetables that you can just throw in there and say, I don't really know how long I should cook this. So let's look at, well, let's look at asparagus. If I wanna cook asparagus, it tells you I'm gonna steam the asparagus. 
I'm gonna tell you don't preheat the oven. Just cook on one level, although you can cook on more. They said also you should use the solid tray below the perforated tray, just like I did with the shrimp, right? And now it's gonna tell you it's gonna be 210 degrees for eight minutes of steam, and that will cook your asparagus, right? And it's all gonna vary slightly depending on the density of the vegetables. Broccoli is a little bit longer, right? Corn on the cob is longer than that, right? But those are all just in the gourmet mode, right? So you have this ability, if you don't really know how you wanna cook something, or you've never cooked it before, in the convection steam oven or anywhere for that matter. So you don't really have a good baseline idea of where you wanna start. You can just go through and scroll through these things. Now, if you decide to move forward and put a convection steam oven in your, uh, in your home, we'll have an ownership class for you, right? So you're gonna come in and really learn how to use this appliance. And at that time, I'm gonna give you a list of every single one of these gourmet features that are in the oven. So you don't have to do this, which is scroll through and say, oh, how many ways can I cook potatoes? Now I have to look and see, right? I'll just give you a list so you'll know because I've realized that Wolf hadn't published anything like that. There was nothing out there that said, here's all the gourmet way, ways to cook in the convection steam oven. This gives you all the different ways. And some things have different ways to cook it, right? There's different ways to cook it. Good example would be the potato gratin, right? If we're making scalloped potatoes, which is essentially what a potato gratin is, right? And we, want to, and we want to cook that in the convection steam oven and we go to the gourmet feature and we open it up and we look at it and it says, cook. And the next line says, more gourmet. There's two different ways to cook, right? And if we look at the icon on the cook, it says, oh, you use convection steam. Don't preheat the oven. It's gonna be 365 degrees for 45 minutes. That's how long it'll take to cook it in that mode. But there's another way. And this is why I'm coming, around to this because I want to talk about what the more gourmet feature is because the more gourmet feature teaches you a lot about what this oven is really all about. The more gourmet feature uses a sensor in the oven to determine how to cook your potato gratin. So what I've done is I'm going to cook a potato gratin and I follow all the tips which is you know put the gratin in a, in a baking dish put it on one tray. Now it just asks me a question. Does medium brown sound like the way you want the top of your potatoes? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Medium brown sounds like I, I could be happy with that. Okay, great, let's choose medium brown. First thing I notice when I touch enter is that I can't do anything about the temperature. I can't change anything. I can't set the mode, right? Can't do that. And it gives me a number. It says it's going to take 44 minutes to cook that potato gratin. Okay, great. So then all I have to do is take my potato gratin, put it in the oven, hit start, and it'll cook it for me. And how does it do that? How does it determine the temperature? Because all I've told it is I like medium brown potato gratin and it's potatoes. The sensor in the oven is very, very, very sensitive that sounds redundant but that's what it is it's a very sensitive sensor right and when it takes when i program it when i say medium brown potato gratin now the oven knows those two things a how i want it cooked and b what it is then i put that in the oven and i hit start first thing the oven does is it takes its own temperature it takes the temperature of the internal cavity of the oven it then raises the temperature to another point. By doing that, right, by calculating the time it took to go from temperature A to temperature B, it is able to roughly estimate the mass of the food that I put into the oven. So now it knows three things. What I wanna cook, how I want it cooked, and how much that weighs. It then does its own little calculating and it'll just say preparing or is being determined, right? And then all of a sudden, about four minutes from now, it'll ding and that number that was 44 minutes is gonna be a different number because now it's calculated how long it's gonna to take to cook it because it determined the mass, then it puts in the temperature that it wants to use and the amount of steam it's gonna use. So then it's able to determine how long it's gonna to take to cook 
that potato gratin to the exact specifications that I've asked for, which was medium red, which was medium brown. So that's how the sensor works. Yes, Hal. You can change it. Exactly. You can say medium brown, light brown, well browned, I think is the words they use. The same thing is true there for the bread, right? So the bread is this. Well brown. That's the darkest crust, right? So that's the darkest crust. And the bread is the sensor as well. It's exactly the same thing. So the bread, right? In the gourmet feature, there's more than one way to bake a loaf of bread in the oven. You may know, Penny may know, I have this great loaf. I bake it in my oven. I always use 400 degrees for 47 minutes. And it always comes out perfect, right? So what Penny can do is she can go to this oven and say, I'm gonna make that same exact loaf. And I'm gonna put it in the oven at 400 degrees for 47 minutes, right? And I'm gonna choose the bread auto steam bake is what we call it, auto steam bake, right? I'm gonna use that mode to bake my bread at my exact specifications, 400, 47 minutes. The oven then is gonna add the steam because it knows you wanna bake bread. You've just told it what temperature you wanna use and how long you wanna do it. Now, my guess would be is that her bread will be done in like 43 minutes. It'll be a little bit faster because the oven is more efficient than a larger oven cavity. So you can, you have bread modes like that, that if you know how you want to bake it, you can choose that. Or you can go to the gourmet mode where you just say, I like my bread dark brown. I want the heaviest crust you can give me. Great. I'll just push that button, well browned, put the bread in, cold oven. And this is what it comes out with. About 40, well, no, these were 42 minutes. About 40, 40, just a little over 40 minutes to bake the whole thing, right? So the bread becomes a great example of the sensor because it, you can really change it, right? If you really want, if you don't like a heavy crust, like, you know, and I've known people like this who just, they don't like a really heavy, dense crust. They like their crust to be much softer, right? Well, then you can choose light brown and you get a much softer crust because it's less steam in the oven cavity. So I want to give you another example. So anybody got questions about the gourmet feature and how that works and how the sensor works? And it's literally just there so that if you don't know how to cook something, it'll give you options. Sometimes it's one option, sometimes it's three. But there's lots of different options in the gourmet. Mode. Yes, Will? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Is that a feature or is that how do you control it? Ah, thank you for segueing right into my very next topic. Um, so how do you control that? Anybody here make risotto? Who's made risotto? From scratch. From, from, from scratch? Not, from scratch. Not from scratch. Will makes it from scratch. And Will, you like to spend 25, 30 minutes just stirring the risotto right there on the stove. Right? You're good, right? Exactly. So I'm going to make risotto in the oven, right? This one is a, a, a method developed by our chef in St. Louis. She came up with this. And so basically I cooked my onions, my garlic, put a little saffron in there. Then I added the rice, toasted it just a little bit on the stove, added a little bit of wine, let it reduce. Now I've just heated up the broth, right? Poured it over that rice, right? I'm going to put it in the oven. Right, just right on the tray. Try not to spill anything. Now, here's where the oven gets fun. So when we start using those combination modes, convection steam, this is where the oven gets interesting. Because this is where we're using, like I was talking at the very beginning about steam, convection together, right? So I'm gonna go to convection steam, 330 degrees, program for about 31 minutes. And it's gonna fire up. So the first thing it's gonna do is gonna start making steam. Yes, Lynn, you have a question? Yeah, this is really something that doesn't practice for me. Uh-huh. Um, say if we were doing um, tight, like a and you feel like it might be a little bit longer, 
Okay. You can extend it. Okay. Yes. How do you do that? So you just, you, oh, so like in the more gourmet mode? Yeah. So you that you can't extend. Okay. <laughs> no, if it's, if, if they're feeling like, oh, it's not done enough or not browned enough, um, boy, I've never had that happen. Um, you could just, what I would recommend you do is use what we were about to talk about, convection steam at a high temperature and leave it in for just until the point where it's browned enough that they feel like they've got enough color on it. It's not going to, well, it shouldn't overcook it depending on what it is that they're cooking. But no, with the more gourmet features, once you've established what you want, it will only cook it for that amount of time and then it will turn that process off. And you can't replicate it because you don't know exactly what the temperature was. Exactly. So convection steam is going to marry those two uh, types of cooking together. It's going to make steam. It's going to start adding moisture into that oven cavity to help my risotto stay a little bit moister, but it's going to actually cook the rice. Those chickens that you saw um, Nikki take over and put into one of the other ovens in the, in the, in the showroom, Again, we're using convection steam at 400 and 400 degrees, but we're also using one of the other features of the oven, which is your temperature probe that comes with the oven. So now we've inserted the probe into the thickest part of the breast, right? And we've set that internal temperature to 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And now we're gonna cook, not with a timer, but with the temperature probe. So now Will was asking, it's like, how does it get brown? How do we brown stuff? How do we get that nice crispy skin on the chicken, right? How does that work? In? Because it'll be counterintuitive to all of you when I say you use steam to make things brown. It makes no sense, right? Because nobody is going to take a beautiful steak and throw it in a pot of water and boil it in order to get the nicest exterior on their steak, right? Same thing with the chicken breast. You're not gonna get a nice crispy skin on a chicken if you have put it in a pot of water. But with the convection steam oven, now we're using steam at the beginning, we're moisturizing the food, we're accelerating the cooking, right? By using the steam, but we're still raising that temperature up to a high temperature, right? To 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, now things are gonna to start to brown and get crispy in so much as you can even take chicken parmesan we've all made chicken parmesan at least once right bread the chicken breasts fry them in a skillet then maybe you put them on a baking sheet you put cheese or sauce or sauce and cheese depending on which camp you come from whether the sauce goes on first or the cheese goes on first my wife and i we argue about this vehemently um but you can take those breaded chicken breasts Instead of taking them into a saute pan and browning them in olive oil, you could just put them onto a tray, put them in a 440 degree convection steam oven, in convection steam, and crisp up those breadcrumbs, make it look like it was fried, but it was never fried. No oil. You just oven fry them. It's not like an air fryer. Don't get them confused. It's not like that. But that steam, right, moisturizes that, and then that high temperature crisps up those chicken, those breadcrumbs. The same thing is going to be true on the skin of those chicken that's coming out of that oven over there, right? We're roasting those at 400 degrees using our temperature probe, using the convection steam mode. That's going to crisp up and brown up those steams. In fact, those chicken, in fact, the average whole chicken takes roughly 45 to 50 minutes in the convection steam oven to cook all the way through right? And keep it really, really nice and moist and tender. So, and still get the browning. So the wear convection steam becomes this really remarkable mode is that it at a high temperature browns, crisps, right? Gives things color and texture, right? Even though there's steam employed because the steam is still being used throughout. So it's softening and sort of like, sort of like tenderizing the stuff inside, making your your French fries, right? So like, it's like having cooking French fries where you want the inside of the French fry to be soft and the outside to be crispy. Same idea as here with roasting the chicken or roasting potatoes in convection steam. The steam softens the middle and then the outside is crisp 
by the high temperatures. And so it does create that environment, create that result when you're using convection steam at a high temperature. But what about at a low temperature, right? How low do you think we can go with convection steam? We can go down to 180 degrees. So now think about what you would use a moist, low temperature environment for cooking in. What would you cook at, say, 225 degrees in a very moisture rich environment? Smoking meat, right? Ribs, ribs, pot roast, uh, shanks, pulled pork. Anything that you have a low, slow cooking process, you want to keep it nice and moist, right? And cook it nice and slow. Convection steam at a low temperature is a slow cooker, right? So pulled pork, osobuco, brisket, pot roast, all of those things can be slow cooked in the convection steam oven using that mode. Because at that low temperature now, it's not going to brown as much, but it's going to keep it super moist. So your pulled pork is just going to fall off the, fall apart, right? So it works really nicely. What else do you think you could use convection steam for that you might normally use an oven with sort of an adaptation of a larger pan, right? What, what can you think, what would you think might be convection steam? Think moisture, anybody ever made a cheesecake? Water baths, all that stuff, creme brulee, custards, all those things. Water baths, thing of the past. Don't need it. Just take your custards, put them on your baking sheet, straight in. And just let them steam at 210 degrees, right? But use convection steam. It's not as fully, so it's not like there's not water dripping into your food but there's steam in the environment. So it's insulating those custards so they don't over, your flan doesn't over brown, doesn't over bake, doesn't curdle, right? Your cheesecake sets so that the top is perfect, no cracks, because it's the insulation of the steam in that low temperature environment, 225 degrees, your cheesecake is perfect every single time. And you don't have to use a water bath because we've all done the water bath thing where we're doing this or we're pouring the boiling water in the oven Right? There's all sorts of things that we have to do. In this case, we don't have to do that at all. We live, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. All of those things that you might normally use a water bath before because you're afraid that you're gonna over, you're gonna scramble eggs, right? In your cheesecake or your flourless chocolate cake, it's not gonna set nicely and be creamy and smooth. You don't need the water bath here. You just put it in the oven. One word of caution with those, with those desserts, make sure you cover the top of your cheesecake because there's obviously steam in there. So if the steam condenses and drips for any reason into your cake, it'll make spots. Won't ruin it, but it'll just make spots. So just put something over top of it. You, you, a shower cap, a piece of plastic wrap, piece of aluminum foil, right? Something like that, just, yep, yeah, just use a shower cap. Just works great, just put it right over your pan. It's not gonna melt not at 225 degrees, right? It's not gonna be damaged at all, right? So it just keeps the water out of the, the cake and around the environment, right? So convection steam, that's where it starts to become, you know, a really unique appliance because no other oven can do that unless you have the steam present, right? The bread is a great example of that as well. Who, who here got sucked into the sourdough thing over the pandemic and you made your own sourdough? No, but you've made it before. And have you done all the gymnastics that it takes to get your oven to the point where you're creating a steam environment for your bread in your oven? Like you've got the, you've got the cast iron skillets with the lids and they're in the bottom, right? And the bottom of your oven, it's 500 degrees. So you've got to take your bread, you've got to put it into your cast iron skillet, you've got to spritz it three times with a water bottle. Then you got to cover it with another cast iron skillet. Then you got to close the oven door and you got to pray that it rises inside and creates a nice steamy environment, right? You've got to go through all those things or you can just do in the convection steam oven where you don't have to do any of those things. You just put it on a tray and bake it, right? It's literally like, it's not quite as easy as baking a cake from a box, but it's pretty close. So that's where that steam part really becomes the most interesting because you can just, you don't have to determine if you, how much steam to go in or if it's gonna run out, right? The oven's gonna to know to, you, to produce steam to make your bread.
bake to the temperature and the, and the crust that you want. So, need an opener? You got one. Okay. Um, so, absolutely. Absolutely. So long as you're using the common sense of just saying, okay, what's going to take the longest to cook? What's going to be the shortest? And what's going to be, and is there something kind of in between? Exactly. Exactly. So in other words, if you're doing to do potatoes and you want to roast some salmon to go with your potatoes and you want some asparagus, you can cook all three of those in convection steam. The potatoes are going to take the longest. So you're going to start with the potatoes. Then the salmon's going to take slightly less time than potatoes, but more time than the asparagus. So then you're going to add the salmon. And then the last thing you're going to do is throw those asparagus on the same tray and cook them all at the same time. Exactly. 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 Right. And again, there are there is that sheet that comes that gives you rough guidelines for how long it's going to take to cook a chicken breast or this or that. So you can kind of gauge off of that. Hmm? Other than limitations, obviously of, of size, what do you not? <laughs> So Ken was asking, this is for the folks of joining us on the video, um, what you can't do in the convection steam oven. Remember I said you could do it on one hand. So the first thing you can't do is you can't broil anything. There's no broiler in the convection steam oven. So you can't melt cheese on top of your French onion soup. You can't, um, you know, brown off the top of your macaroni and cheese. If you have a nice crispy topping, you can't do that. There's no broiler. So it doesn't broil. That's one. Second thing you can't do in your convection steam oven. And here's where I say, remember I said it can replace or it can supplement your big oven and microwave. What it can't do, what the, what the steam oven can't do that a microwave can is pop popcorn and reheat your coffee. And now the list is done. Everything else that I can do in either one of these ovens, I can do here. And there are certainly things obviously that I can do in this oven that I can't do in either one of these. Because I can't steam in either one of these without having to rig a steamer in order to, to achieve that goal. So those are really the three things that you cannot do. You can't broil, you can't pop your popcorn and you can't, um, you can't heat up your coffee. Now, would you melt your butter or your chocolate in a convection steam oven? It's not that you can't. You could definitely turn it on to convection at a low temperature, right? 90 degrees and melt your butter. You could just throw a bowl of butter in there at 90 degrees and it'll melt. Or you could use a pan on the stove or you could use a microwave. You could do that to melt butter. Chocolate, better to do it on the stove especially if you have any of the wolf burners, whether it's gas or induction, just use the melt burner and melt your chocolate. You don't even need a double boiler to melt your chocolate. You can just put it in a saucepan, put it on your melt burner and just let it melt and it won't scorch, won't burn like that. So those are things that you could do in the convection steam oven, but there are better ways to do it um, than that. But there really are no other limitations, Ken. Um, and like I said before, with size, the only thing that you can't fit in there is going to be a 23 pound turkey, right? A nine bone standing rib roast. That's going to be a little problematic in the CSO. Um, but everything else you can do in that, and especially with the convection steam mode, using the high for the brown and the crispy and the color and the caramelization and um, using the lows for your water bath or your slow cooking techniques, right? All of those things are going to, give you that flexibility in the convection steam mode, right? So the other mode, and I thought, you know, this was, you know, part of the challenge of being the chef here at Roth and having all this great equipment and having, I mean, I do a lot of these CSO classes. I do ownership classes. I do a lot of different classes. So I'm constantly trying not to repeat myself. I'm always trying to find different ways to, to showcase the appliance and come up with, you know, a different preparation or something that would really say, boy, you could really benefit if you knew how to do this in this oven, right? 
So I'm always trying to come up with different ways to, to cook things and things that I can cook in different modes. And one of the modes, the other, one of the other modes in the oven is what we call convection humid, right? Convection humid makes virtually no sense in terms of, because on face value, you're thinking to yourself, what the heck does that mean? You've got convection steam. I understand that convection and steam, but convection humid. Is that like what? I mean, convection, I get that part. There's a fan, but the humid part, like it, it sounds literally like it's just a hot day in Tallahassee and we're walking around, you know, and it's just this kind of moist, icky, you know, what is convection humid? It doesn't make any sense. So convection humid is an interesting mode. And it was one of the modes that I was challenged. I think I had to come up with something to cook in convection humid mode for today's class. And I thought, what is convection humid? What can I use it for? And let me explain a little bit about what convection humid is all about. The oven has the unique ability, right? Unlike a lot of other ovens, that it can not vent its cavity during a baking process, during a roasting process. And in convection humid, that's exactly what the oven does. It doesn't vent the oven. It stores all the moisture in the oven cavity in the oven cavity. It doesn't release it out into the atmosphere. It does that in convection steam. There is moisture being released from the oven cavity. And in convection, we're releasing some of that hot air, right? We're venting some of that hot air, but in convection humid, we don't do that. We seal the oven up so everything stays inside. The oven doesn't actually make its own steam in convection humid. In other words, I can run convection humid in the reservoir completely empty. But when I open the door to the oven, steam comes pouring out because all the moisture that was in the food is stored in the oven cavity. So where does that benefit me? Anything that's super moist when it goes in the oven and I want it to come out moist, that's the mode to use. So examples of that might be anything made with a batter, banana bread, quick breads, bunt cakes, Anything like that, where you want to keep them moist, right? Muffins, stuff like that. I want to keep them moist. I don't want them to dry out. I want them to bake, but I want them to stay moist. Convection humid is your best friend there. I made a banana bread last week. Phenomenal how moist it comes out. Selena is applauding because she got like three pieces of that banana bread. So, um, but that's what it's great for because it allows you to bake with the confidence of knowing you're not going to dry it out, but it's still going to bake and brown really beautifully. What else can you use convection humid for? If you're doing a casserole, something that you have a, it's really moist when it goes into the oven and you want to retain that lasagna. I don't want to dry out my lasagna. I want my casseroles to be, stay nice and moist. I don't want them to just be noodles with little bits of sauce clinging to it. I want it to be nice and moist. I'm going to use convection humid for that. So in this case, I took my vegetables, my ratatouille vegetables, right? And I shingled them with uh, underneath there's peppers and onions. And then we have the zucchini and tomato and eggplant all on top. And I just gently cook them in the convection humid mode. So these are beautiful and moist, but they're all, you can see they're nicely caramelized and cooked through. So in convection humid, right, I'm able to retain all that moisture in the oven whilst it's baking so that I can get something nice and moist the way I want it to come out that way. So convection humid is just that extra mode. I use it for cookies all the time. I like my cookies sometimes to be a little moist in the middle, but crispy on the outside. I mean, I like, that's how I like my chocolate chip cookies. You that just this, I just baked it. It was on this rack, just like that. So yes, that you just use your, your own vessel when you have this in there or you're doing your hard boiled eggs, which you just literally put right on the rack. So convection humid is just that one. And now we're going to, when this in 11 minutes, when that was the risotto is done, we're going to put this in and we're going to flash it in the reheat mode to reheat it. Okay. So reheating again, as we were talking about, uses a little bit of steam at a slightly lower temperature, 250 degrees, right? But again, it knows that it just needs to heat that food through. It knows it's already cooked. So now it's just going to heat it through, but it's going to use steam to re-moisturize it. So here's a great thing. Let's say you decide, boy, boy, I really like that bread that Ben made at class of the day. And so you send me an email and say, would you please send me the recipe for that bread? And I'm happy to do that. I'll send you the recipe and you can make a couple loaves of this bread. But then you, you eat one, right? You have a dinner party, you eat one whole loaf, 
but you don't have the other one. And what happens to bread in Colorado if we just leave it on the counter for two days? It's like a rock, right? I mean, you could literally use it as a doorstop. It's so hard, okay? Take this loaf of bread, put it in the oven, just like this, right on the rack. Hit the refresh bread button, and it will, it's a reheat function, a little bit of steam, a little bit of heat. Next thing you know, it's right back where it was when you baked it. Three days after you let it sit on your counter because you didn't have a chance to eat it, it will refresh the bread and make it like you just baked it. So the reheat function, right, is quite frankly, almost worth the price of the, worth the, price of the oven alone because it will improve your leftovers. It'll make you almost look forward to leftovers because you know they're gonna be better than they were in some cases when you first cooked it. And will that reheat bread work like bread? Absolutely. Any bread. You wanna refresh it, doesn't have to be my fancy loaf, which is not really that fancy, but anything like that. You wanna just refresh the bread, the reheat mode will do that. Again, steam and a lower temperature convection creates the environment to refresh the bread, right? Um, if you, you need to defrost it before you refresh it. Yes, absolutely. I've done frozen bread refreshed in there. So it will work really nicely for that. So that reheat feature, right? There's, and there's a gourmet reheat feature as well, right? And in the gourmet feature, again, it uses the sensor. So if you're telling it, I want you to reheat but you give it one, of, one other piece of information. I either need it to be really moist or crispy. And you just tell the oven that I want it crispy, like a loaf of bread or a slice of pie or frozen egg rolls, all of those things. I can then just put them in there and hit the crispy reheat and it automatically figures out how much time, how much heat, how much steam in order to make the crispy egg rolls again. Right, so the, the oven will do that for your reheat. So, okay, so the reheat feature. So here, there's the chickens. Perfect. Um, and we're just right here at eight minutes left for our risotto. So, one of the other things you'll notice um, when you see this oven is that you'll see in the gourmet feature it'll say fresh pizza. Well, it's 30 seconds ago. Did I tell you about the crispy on the skin? <laughs> so can you see this link? Let me, oh wait. How long was chicken Less than an hour. And again, probe, right? So here, let me do this. I know my cameras pretty well. So let me just slide this over so you guys can get Sorry, it's a little. Nice. It looks better live. <laughs> but you can just see how nicely crispy the skin is on that, right? How even, right? So, and again, you've got your probe here, so you're able to make sure your internal is good. Hey, um, Nikki, before you heat that, I want to pop it in the reheat session, just for a second. No, I didn't put any fat on the exterior of the chicken. Just so you guys know, I'll give you my quick chicken process. Yesterday, both chickens were salted liberally inside and out, allowed to sit on a rack, on a sheet tray, uncovered in the sub-zero overnight. Um, just to allow, what happens is the salt liquefies, then as the salt liquefies, it's absorbed into the chicken and it dries the chicken, it takes out a little, no brine, it's like a dry brine. It's essentially like a dry brine. The dry brine um, then takes out. So then this morning when I got here, um, took them out, I trussed them, stuffed them with a little bit of uh, fresh thyme leaves. Um, and then I took a little bit of really good um, butter and shoved it under the skin of the chicken. Because remember that chicken skin is a semi-permeable membrane. It doesn't allow 
fat to go through it. Flavor doesn't go through it. You have to get the flavor under it to get the flavor to the, to the actual flesh of the chicken. So then just let it um, put the butter underneath and nothing on top. So, no, the browning is purely the oven. There's nothing on the outside of the chicken to promote it to brown. I didn't rub it with oil or butter or anything. All this is purely just the steam cooking the chicken and then the convection fans and the heat browning the chicken, just like that. So works out pretty nicely, all right? Um, so what I was gonna say before the chickens arrived, um, we're gonna squeeze these roasted lemons on top of them when they're done. So got these lemons, anyway. Um, You'll notice that there says fresh potato, or it'll say potatoes, or it'll say fresh pizza, or it'll say fresh appetizers. Know this, anywhere you see the word fresh in your convection steam oven, it has a frozen equivalent. So if there's a fresh potato, there's a frozen potato somewhere else. Fresh pizza, frozen pizza. Fresh appetizers, frozen appetizers. Again, the oven is very, very smart, so if you are at that moment where you just like, I just can't cook tonight, but I have a bag of frozen sweet potato fries in my freezer. You put the sweet potato fries onto the tray. You go to the, yes, Will. So the other smart, uh -huh. which means it's driven by software. Right. What do you do about software updates? I've heard two things on this. One, I've heard that you can update, they can be updated, but it has to be done manually, like somebody has to come and plug something into it. Um, and then I've heard from somebody else that you can't update the software, that the operating system cannot be. I've heard both, I don't know what the correct answer is. I wish I did. Um, but um, someone originally told me when I was in Madison once, which is where these are built, that that's that the software was updatable, that you could actually improve it, right? But I don't know that for, for a fact. Yeah. Yeah, it would be a great question to get a definitive answer on. So you get the fresh pizza. No stone. So your fresh pizza, the oven's gonna, you're gonna tell it I wanna bake a fresh pizza. Um, it will determine temperature and um mode right for that but the frozen pizza right it all you have to tell the frozen pizza the, the oven from the frozen pizza the box says bake 400 degrees for 30 minutes all you need to remember is 30 minutes because you're telling the oven i have a frozen pizza and it says to bake it for 30 minutes the oven will do the rest it'll determine how long how hot what kind of mode, how much steam in order to get your frozen pizza back to edible states. So, um, it doesn't make a frozen pizza like the best pizza on the planet. Let me just tell you that right now. It's still a frozen pizza, but it does cook it really nicely. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And you can just bake it right on one of the trays. I wouldn't bake it on the rack, just bake it on one of the trays, but it'll work out really nicely. So if you see this tart, this is my galette, my blackberry and nectarine galette, right? This is dessert, right? So this is that same thing. I just tell the oven I need to bake a pie because of the crust. And then the oven determines how to bake it. So I just tell it I like it medium brown and it determines. It does the same thing with the pizzas, uh, the fresh pizza. It just bakes it perfectly. So. We're down to a minute and 52 seconds. And then we'll stir in some fresh herbs for our risotto and we'll flash in our, um, our gratin in order just to just warm it just ever so briefly. Um, and we'll just use the manual mode for reheating that. We're not gonna use the auto modes. We're just gonna use a manual mode just to kind of break the chill on it, just warm it. But you'll see that it gets it nice and moist. It really does do a great job with reheating. And it'll do like reheat stuff that you would never eat reheated ever. And the best example of that, I always use this example because you know, I'm like a broken record, but it's rice from any takeout restaurant. Most people know that if you put that box of rice in your refrigerator for one day, the following day, it has the consistency of like 
chalk dust. It's just, it's, it's grainy, it's gritty, it, it's awful, right? And when you try to reheat it in a microwave, it gets worse, right? In the convection steam oven, just put the rice into a bowl, put it in the convection steam, reheat, moist. It's like you just steamed the rice. I kid you, it's ridiculous how well it does that. Because I, I don't eat that. I just throw it away. My wife says, we should save the rice. I'm like, for what? No one's ever going to eat that, right? The cat won't even eat it. So no, uh, we don't, you don't. But in the convection steam, it really does make a difference when you hit that reheat. So and just remember with the reheating, I would recommend that you just use those auto reheat settings. It really does work well. If you're afraid to, you don't know how to reheat something, just using the moisture, uh, the crispy settings for reheating really does. It just comes out perfect every single time. So, all right. So I'm just going to add some fresh parsley. I like to add the herbs at the end, a little bit of rosemary, not a lot, a little bit of fresh thyme. All right, so where's my wrap? All right. And then we'll go to reheat mode. So a lot of times when you're using the oven oh, and you finish a process, you get to the end and there's this screen. And the first screen says switch appliance off. So I'm done with it. If I back up one thing, it tells me to extend the process. So whatever I was just doing, I can do exactly that for as much time more as I would like, just allows you to extend the process. So if you look at it and you think, oh, I need to cook that a little bit longer, I just extend that exact same thing that I was doing for five minutes. And then you can do that until you're done. Or you get even, no, not, not more room. Only if you've set the process. Like I did convection steam 3, 330. But in this case, I wanna change operating modes because I wanna go to reheat. So I go back to the operating mode, then I go to reheat, which is right there, 250, just gonna give it a couple minutes. The default time is nine, but I don't need nine minutes for this. I'm just gonna do that and that's gonna go. And just quick reheat that. So I'm gonna pass the risotto over to the girls. Okay, you want this here? And the chickens. Come on. So you see this uh, porcelain enamel pan. This is an accessory that you can get for your oven if you don't want the stainless steel. You can get the porcelain enamel. Um, I, I don't know if this is true, but I always feel like things brown better when I use this pan than when I use the stainless steel pan. I think it can be a complete figment of my imagination, but it certainly seems like that's the case. Don't know, but it's just one of those things you can you can get if you want, but I want to just show you how nice and moist these are and how nicely cooked through it is. So here's right on the bone. Can you see that right on the bone of the chicken? How nicely cooked that is in less than an hour. Can I, can you guys see that? So 
but you can just see there's nice moisture. I mean, this chicken is beautiful and moist on the inside, but it's cooked all the way through to the bones. So you don't, I mean, it really is, as long as you're using that, if you're using that temperature probe and the convection steam setting, you're never gonna have a problem with just undercooking or it's just always gonna come out just beautifully. And with that steam involved, you see it less than an hour. I think you were all pretty like blown away that I cooked two chickens in less than an hour. Um, for most people, that's a pretty, pretty unique. So anyway, and again, I'll, I even show you the right here in the leg joint, right? There is no, no blood at all in the leg joints as well. So again, it really is. I mean, this is a pretty simple process, obviously cooking, roasting a chicken. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, so many people say, oh, you know, that's how you mark a good cook or a good chef. If you can roast a, you know, a chicken without drying it out and keep it nice and moist and cooked all the way through. Um, but, and this is convection steam oven is going to make your life much easier in that respect. So. Okay. So if you guys want to put some of the chicken, I'll grab the, so I don't think you want that knife. There's some, Breasts, breasts. There's a leg that she said nobody's going to eat. Nikki said that every time we serve chicken, nobody ever wants the legs. Just so you guys know, just so you know, when I worked in France, right? I worked in France many, 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 many years ago. And one of the things that I was taught working at these really fancy French restaurants, that it, it was okay, even in the fanciest French restaurant. That if you got poultry and you got the leg, you could pick it up with your fingers. You did not have to eat it with a knife and fork. That it was okay, even in that crazy expensive restaurant, to pick up the chicken and eat it. So that's right. And you get <laughs> that's true. That is true. That is very true. Right. So just giving that a quick flash in the reheat mode and again just a few minutes just to just to kind of break that chill on the on the on the vegetables but you don't you don't necessarily have to do this but again you'll see a little bit of steam when we open the door um because obviously there is steam produced and anytime the oven is making steam it will tell you with that little icon check mark over the steam uh box letting you know yes we are going to be using steam for producing this so you're going to make sure there's water in your reservoir so, yeah, just because I don't really need the extensiveness of those reheat modes, but I could have, yes, that is correct. And I would have chosen moist. You want me to cut some more? So just... I know why. I apologize. I know. You don't need to give any of this to me, right? Just for you and. There'll be one plate short of the rattan, but that's okay. I didn't know that Selena was going to be here with Nick. With one. Okay, there we go. Got it? All right. Okay, so questions. Lynn, do you have any questions from folks online or anything like that? Hal's got a question. No, I think Anna, there's 
Uh huh. Right. Right. So the, the probe, so you're going to use your probe, how for that. And what I would recommend is that when you're cooking any meat, any, whether it's leg of lamb, prime rib, pork roast, pork loin, uh, veal shoulder, entrecot, you know, New York strip, uh, roast beef, whatever it is, right? The mode to use, wait, what do I do with my iPad? There it is. The mode to use is this one. All right. In my favorite button is here. It's the more button. In the more button, you have a number of different processes that they just couldn't figure out how to put it on the panel. So they just stuck it under this more setting. So there's a lot of unique functions in there. But one of those functions is this mode here, slow roast mode, right? Remember that when we were cooking those prime ribs at the Moscone Center, right? That was in a slow roasting mode. We had to cook them slowly, right? So that we could make sure that we were controlling the, not only the internal temperature, but the external so they didn't over brown or get too you know, tough on the outside. So we use this slow roast mode. The slow roast mode is basically designed for all forms of meat, right? No poultry, but meat. So beef, lamb, pork, veal, you could do, I've done bison in here as well um, as that same mode. But what it is, is if we're using slow roast, it raises, it doesn't raise the temperature of the oven above like 225 degrees. It keeps it very slow. It slowly cooks it, right? To the exact internal temperature that you have specified. So if you ask for 137 degrees Fahrenheit, it will cook it to exactly that temperature. And once the probe is, and if the probe is inserted, right, and it reaches that at exactly the time, because I, who was it who asked me about getting it done at exactly the time? Ken asked me about that. So in the slow roast mode, right, let's say I want to do that rib, that prime rib. So I go here, let's say I like it rare. Okay, it tells me which rack position. It tells me it's going to cook it to 135 degrees. I cannot change the temperature, but I can choose the amount of time that I want it to take in order to cook that prime rib, right? And so in this case, I might choose three hours and 30 minutes, right? So the oven knows it has three hours and 30 minutes to cook this prime rib to 135 degrees. I can then change the end time so that I may plan for exactly when I want it done as long as that end time is at least three hours and 30 minutes from right now. So if it's two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon and I want to have my dinner party that evening and I want to serve my prime rib at 7 p.m., I can program it to say, be done at 7 p.m. Insert the probe, right? Put the prime rib in the oven. The oven will turn on automatically at 3.30 in the afternoon. It will roast until seven o'clock to that exact internal temperature. And then it will shut off the oven. And as long as the probe is inserted in the prime rib, it will continue to hold the at that internal temperature that I specified until I take the probe out and take it out of the oven. It'll hold it without overcooking because it, it will just maintain the temperature using a combination of steam and warming temperatures in order to hold that rib at exactly that temperature until I'm ready to serve it. So, so food safety issues aside, Right. Let's say I really want to eat at six thirty. Right. I could say be done at six. I could put it in at noon. Uh huh. And like I said, food safety issues aside. Right. They don't 
finish at six and then six to six thirty, it's just gonna mm -hmm. keep it, it happening. Uh-huh, exactly. Exactly. So you can have it done in advance, so long as you don't take it out of the oven and you leave the probe inserted, it will hold it at that temperature that you specified you wanted it cooked towards too. It won't dry it out. No, 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 and it won't keep cooking it because you told it to be done at six. So it will turn that process off. What it will not turn off is the moisture that's staying in the cavity to hold it at that temperature, just like those big ovens used to hold our prime ribs for us when we were ready to serve it. The other nice thing about it is that if you want to serve it at the exact moment that it was done, you don't need to rest it. It will rest it for you. So that when you take it out of the oven and put it onto your cutting board and slice it, you won't bleed out all over your cutting board. It will just be perfect. And it will be the exact temperature that you specified from one end and one side, top to bottom, it'll be exactly the same. You won't have grandma's well done on the end. It won't be well done on the end. It'll be medium rare on the end, it'll be medium rare in the middle, and it'll be medium rare at the other end, so that the whole thing is one temperature. It won't be medium here, medium rare, rare, it won't be varied temperatures, it'll all be the same. And it will be rested to the exact point in time so that you know when you take it out, because you said six o'clock, you could take it out at six, Ken, and serve it without any worry of losing all the moisture. But if you wait till 6.30, it's gonna be exactly the same. It's not gonna lose any of its moisture, it's gonna be ready to go. And you just slice it and serve it. And you talk about sous vide in your steaks. Would you, would you pull them below temperature knowing that no. when you char them, it's gonna add? It's not gonna add that many degrees. It won't. I mean, because if you, if you have a wolf grill, you heat your sear burner up to whatever ridiculous temperature that gets to, and then your steak is 135, you just literally take it out of the bag, pat it dry with a paper towel, just quickly sear it on both sides just to give yourself the color and the, and the, the flavor, you're good to go. You can. Now, that's a good question, Will. I do that whenever I use the slow roast mode, and I think this speaks a little bit to what Hal was asking. Um, I always pre-sear my roasts before I put them into the CSO. So I put them on the barbecue, I put them on my griddle, I do something to give it some color on the outside. And usually I've, I, maybe I'll do a marinade or a rub, just depends on how you like it. But I always pre-sear it, because as I said before, the one thing the oven can't do is broil, right? So I can't get that top heat to, to really brown the top of it. I can't do that. But if I do it in advance and then I roast it, I guarantee you it'll be perfect on the inside and the outside is just on you to make that searing. Then it works perfectly for me from, the, from that slow roasting point of view. Because it takes the timing right off your plate. You never, I mean, if, it's really easy to time your sides if you know that the meat or the roast, whatever you're serving, is gonna be perfect and done exactly when you want it. Then, you know, because if you can make mashed potatoes, you can hold those. You can make, you know, scalloped potatoes and hold them. You can make a rice peel off and hold it. All these things hold really nicely. It's the roast that you worry about because that's the last thing you wanna overcook. So if this takes that off your plate, it's really a nice way to be able to plan a dinner party because it will take that completely off your plate. So how does the timing Slow roast, uh huh. To get the consistency. Uh huh. And normally you compare that to a primary cooked at 300, sure. degrees right. For 15 minutes after right. Thing, right. Right. That's going to be that should be a faster cook than uh -huh. the steam oven, but with the steam efficiency, uh -huh. is it similar. In terms of time, you are cooking at a much lower temperature, and because you are specifying that internal temperature and the oven knows exactly what it is you're cooking, right? So it raises and lowers the temperature depending on the cut that you're cooking. So in other words, a fattier cut, right? May be a higher temperature cooking because it wants to get a little bit, whereas a tender, a more tender cut, like a tenderloin, that's gonna be a lower temperature because it really doesn't wanna dry it in out because it's leaner, right? So it gauges how, hot the oven needs to be by the cut, which is why you specify the cut 
when you're programming it, whether it's leg of lamb or shoulder of pork versus like a loin of pork. So they're different in terms of how it cooks it. So it just knows that. And so it is then programmed to, to cook those cuts in the period of time that you specify. So you can do as short as two and a half hours or as long as four and a half hours. So depending on how long you want to leave something in the oven or how much time you have, you can go longer or shorter. Um, I haven't seen an advantage yet to cooking the same cut. Like I haven't seen an advantage to roasting the prime rib for four and a half hours versus three and a half hours. It hasn't been appreciably better if I roast it longer versus shorter, I haven't seen a real big difference. The only thing I did notice is that when I once tried to rush something through that cycle and shorten it to two and a half hours, I tried to cook, I don't remember, it might have been prime rib. I think it was prime rib. I cooked it in two and a half hours, cooked just fine. But what I noticed was that the resting period was not quite as accurate. So there was a little bit more blood on the cutting board than there was when I cooked it for three and a half hours. Just that's the only observation I've ever made on the in terms of times of cooking it. But it can take that right off your plate in terms of timing. So really you're in the Bay, so in your Bay Area, so you have dry tip. I do. Would you would you pre sear dry tip and finish it? Then, Absolutely. Just it? Oh no you well would I just grill it? Yeah I mean the advantage to a slow roasted dry tip is I think they're more tender than a grilled tri tip. Because I think grilled tri tip tends to toughen a little bit if you don't, certainly if you don't rest it enough. Um, and the advantage to obviously slow roasting it in there as like a sirloin, because it's obviously part of the sirloin, that it would be really, really tender if you slow roasted a tri tip in there. Absolutely. You talked about earlier about a, a pulled pork or a brisket, but you're not gonna get that bark or whatever. Would you recommend, if you have a smoker, yeah. Smoking first, Smoking first and then finishing it in the oven. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to turn my friends online um, loose to their, to their Tuesday evening and thank them very much for joining us. Um, if there's anything that um, we can help you with, if you need to make an appointment to come in and meet with a consultant, or if you have other questions about the convection steam oven, you can certainly um, come in and see us here at the showroom. We really do advise that you give Selena or Lynn a call and make an appointment. We'll be happy to spend whatever time you need um, discussing not just your convection steam oven questions, but all your Wolf Sub-Zero um, appliance questions. So we do, um, we do encourage you to come on in and spend some time here in the showroom. I think you'll find it to be very beneficial um, when you get to come in. So um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you found this um, instructive. And should you have any questions, um, you can always email someone here uh, if you have questions directly for me and they will just forward those cooking questions hopefully on to me and don't ask me about your backsplash because I really, I really don't have an opinion. Um, but, um, but please, I'm here to, so thank you again for joining us. And uh, so anyway, thanks so much.